This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Twilight of the Idols by Friedrich Nietzsche. Chapter Two, The Problem of Socrates. One. In all ages, the wisest have always agreed in their judgment of life. It is no good. At all times and places the same words have been on their lips, words full of doubt, full of melancholy, full of weariness of life, full of hostility to life. Even Socrates' dying words were, To live means to be ill a long while. I owe a cock to the god Esculapius. Even Socrates had had enough of it. What does that prove? What does it point to? Formerly people would have said, oh, it has been said, and loudly enough, too, by our pessimists, loudest of all, quote, In any case, there must be some truth in this. The consensus sapientium is a proof of truth. Unquote. Shall we say the same today? May we do so? Quote, in any case, there must be some sickness here. Unquote. We make reply. These great sages of all periods should first be examined more closely. Is it possible that they were, every one of them, a little shaky on their legs, effete, rocky, decadent? Does wisdom perhaps appear on earth after the manner of a crow attracted by a slight smell of carrion. 2. This irreverent belief that the great sages were decadent types first occurred to me precisely in regard to that case concerning which both learned and vulgar prejudice was most opposed to my view. I recognized Socrates and Plato as symptoms of decline, as instruments in the disintegration of Hellas, as pseudo-Greek, as anti-Greek. Paren, The Birth of Tragedy, 1872, and Paren. That consensus sapientium, as I perceived ever more and more clearly, did not in the least prove that they were right in the matter on which they agreed. It proved, rather, that these sages themselves must have been alike in some physiological particular, in order to assume the same negative attitude towards life, in order to be bound to assume that attitude. After all, judgments and valuations of life, whether for or against, cannot be true. Their only value lies in the fact that they are symptoms. They can be considered only as symptoms. Per se, such judgments are nonsense. You must therefore endeavor by all means to reach out and try to grasp this astonishingly subtle axiom that the value of life cannot be estimated. A living man cannot do so because he is a contending party, or rather the very object in the dispute and not a judge. Nor can a dead man estimate it, for other reasons. For a philosopher to see a problem in the value of life is almost an objection against him, a note of interrogation set against his wisdom, a lack of wisdom. What? Is it possible that all these great sages were not only decadents, but that they were not even wise? Let me, however, return to the problem of Socrates. To judge from his origin, Socrates belonged to the lowest of the low. Socrates was mob. You know, and you can still see it for yourself, how ugly he was. But ugliness, which in itself is an objection, was almost a refutation among the Greeks. Was Socrates really a Greek? Ugliness is not infrequently the expression of a thwarted development, or of development arrested by crossing. 
In other cases it appears as a decadent development. The anthropologists among the criminal specialists declare that the typical criminal is ugly. Monstrum in fronte, monstrum in animo. But the criminal is a decadent. Translator's footnote. It should be borne in mind that Nietzsche recognized two types of criminals, the criminal from strength and the criminal from weakness. This passage alludes to the latter. Aphorism 45, page 103, alludes to the former. End translator's note. Was Socrates a typical criminal? At all events, this would not clash with that famous physiognomist's judgment which was so repugnant to Socrates' friends. While on his way through Athens, a certain foreigner who was no fool at judging by looks told Socrates to his face that he was a monster, that his body harbored all the worst vices and passions. And Socrates replied simply, You know me, sir. 4. Not only are the acknowledged wildness and anarchy of Socrates's instincts indicative of decadence, but also that preponderance of the logical faculties and that malignity of the misshapen, which was his special characteristic. Neither should we forget those oral delusions, which were religiously interpreted as the demon of Socrates. Everything in him is exaggerated, buffo, caricature. His nature is also full of concealment, of ulterior motives, and of underground currents. I try to understand the idiosyncrasy from which the Socratic equation, reason equals virtue equals happiness, could have arisen. The weirdest equation ever seen, and one which was essentially opposed to all the instincts of the older Hellenes. 5. With Socrates, Greek taste veers round in favor of dialectics. What actually occurs? In the first place, a noble taste is vanquished. With dialectics, the mob comes to the top. Before Socrates' time, Dialectical manners were avoided in good society. They were regarded as bad manners. They were compromising. Young men were cautioned against them. All such proffering of one's reasons was looked upon with suspicion. Honest things, like honest men, do not carry their reasons on their sleeve in such a fashion. It is not good form to make a show of everything. That which needs to be proved cannot be worth much. Wherever authority still belongs to good usage, wherever men do not prove but command, the dialectician is regarded as a sort of clown. People laugh at him, they do not take him seriously. Socrates was a clown who succeeded in making men take him seriously. What then was the matter? 6. A man resorts to dialectics only when he has no other means to hand. People know that they excite suspicion with it, and that it is not very convincing. Nothing is more easily dispelled than a dialectical effect. This is proved by the experience of every gathering in which discussions are held. It can be only the last defense of those who have no other weapons. One must require to extort one's right. Otherwise, one makes no use of it. That is why the Jews were dialecticians. Reynard the fox was a dialectician. What? And was Socrates one as well? 7. Is the Socratic irony an expression of revolt, of mob resentment? Does Socrates as a creature suffering under oppression, enjoy his innate ferocity in the knife thrusts of the syllogism? Does he wreak his revenge on the noblemen he fascinates? As a dialectician, a man has a merciless instrument to wield. He can play the tyrant with it. He compromises when he conquers with it. 
The dialectician leaves it to his opponent to prove that he is no idiot. He infuriates, he likewise paralyzes. The dialectician cripples the intellect of his opponent. Can it be that dialectics was only a form of revenge in Socrates? 8. I have given you to understand in what way Socrates was able to repel. Now it is all the more necessary to explain how he fascinated. One reason is that he discovered a new kind of agon, and that he was the first fencing master in the best circles in Athens. He fascinated by appealing to the combative instinct of the Greeks. He introduced a variation into the contests between men and youths. Socrates was also a great erotic. 9. But Socrates divined still more. He saw right through his noble Athenians. He perceived that his case, his peculiar case, was no exception, even in his time. The same kind of degeneracy was silently preparing itself elsewhere. Ancient Athens was dying out, and Socrates understood that the whole world needed him, his means, his remedy, his special artifice for self-preservation. Everywhere the instincts were in a state of anarchy, everywhere people were within an ace of excess. The monstrum in animo was the general danger. Quote, the instincts would play the tyrant. We must discover a counter-tyrant who is stronger than they. Unquote. On the occasion when that physiognomist had unmasked Socrates, and had told him what he was, a crater full of evil desires, the great master of irony let fall one or two words more, which provide the key to his nature. This is true, he said, but I overcame them all. How did Socrates succeed in mastering himself? His case was, at bottom, only the extreme and most apparent example of a state of distress which was beginning to be general, that state in which no one was able to master himself, and in which the instincts turned one against the other. As the extreme example of this state, he fascinated. His terrifying ugliness made him conspicuous to every eye. It is quite obvious that he fascinated still more as a reply, as a solution, as an apparent cure of this case. 10. When a man finds it necessary, as Socrates did, to create a tyrant out of reason, there is no small danger that something else wishes to play the tyrant. Reason was then discovered as a savior. Neither Socrates nor his patients were at liberty to be rational or not as they pleased. At that time it was de rigueur, it had become a last shift. The fanaticism with which the whole of Greek thought plunges into reason betrays a critical condition of things. Men were in danger. There were only two alternatives, either perish, or else be absurdly rational. The moral bias of Greek philosophy from Plato onward is the outcome of a pathological condition, as is also its appreciation of dialectics. Reason equals virtue equals happiness simply means we must imitate Socrates and confront the dark passions permanently with the light of day, the light of reason. We must at all costs be clever, precise, clear, all yielding to the instincts to the unconscious, leads downward. 11. I have now explained how Socrates fascinated. He seemed to be a doctor, a savior. Is it necessary to expose the errors which lay in his faith in reason at any price? It is a piece of self-deception on the part of philosophers and moralists to suppose that they can extricate themselves from degeneration by merely waging war upon it. They cannot thus extricate themselves 
that which they choose as a means, as the road to salvation, is in itself again only an expression of degeneration. They only modify its mode of manifesting itself. They do not abolish it. Socrates was a misunderstanding. The whole of the morality of amelioration, that of Christianity as well, was a misunderstanding. The most blinding light of day, reason at any price, life made clear, cold, cautious, conscious, without instincts opposed to the instincts, was in itself only a disease, another kind of disease, and by no means a return to virtue, to health, and to happiness. To be obliged to fight the instincts, this is the formula of degeneration. As long as life is in the ascending line, happiness is the same as instinct. 12. Did he understand this himself, this most intelligent of self-deceivers? Did he confess this to himself in the end, in the wisdom of his courage before death? Socrates wished to die. Not Athens, but his own hand gave him the draught of hemlock. He drove Athens to the poisoned cup. Socrates is not a doctor, he whispered to himself. Death alone can be a doctor here. Socrates himself has only been ill a long while. End chapter 2 this recording is in the public domain.